Now it's time for us to look very closely at the three problems that are at the very heart of fear and trembling, where Kierkegaard is turning on the philosophical floodlights or opening up the, the sluice gates, if you, if you like, and um, really tackling both Platonic or Socratic and Hegelian attitudes towards faith, towards philosophy, towards the ethical, and towards what might lie beyond the ethical. Um, what he's saying actually has a lot of meaning, not just for engaging those philosophical positions or traditions or schools, but for philosophy in general. This is why this is a, a perennial interest to philosophy. And the very first one that he begins with, the very first question or problem, is there a teleological suspension of the ethical? You notice there's already some, some terminology there. Uh, teleological, for example. Well, what does teleological mean? When we have this term, we mean um, things that are oriented towards a certain end. Sometimes it's called ideality or purposiveness. Um, the teleology of something it's reason. And this goes back to a Greek term telos, which means end, purpose, the function of something is another way to, to translate it. And is there a teleological suspension of the ethical? That, what does it mean to have a suspension there? Can it be put out of play? Can the ethical, can what the ethical requires be sort of bracketed or set aside for a case, for an issue, for a person, um, for some reason, for some higher purpose. Is this a, a possible thing to think? And he begins by looking at um, ways of understanding philosophy in which that's not really possible. He says, the ethical as such is the universal, and as the universal applies to everyone, that's what it means to be universal, isn't it? Which from another angle means that it applies at all times. It rests imminent in itself. It has nothing outside of itself that is its telos. So the ethical sphere, and we're going to look at exactly what that means in just a moment, the ethical sphere has its own purpose within itself. So at a very basic level, if you were to ask somebody something like, well, why ought we do things that are right? Why ought we do things that are good? There's a certain level of, of intelligibility that gets lost in even posing those questions. You would, you would say something like, maybe you don't understand what good means. Maybe you don't understand what right actually means or even feels like if you're asking that sort of question. Because well, you know, think about cases where people do that. Is it, is it right to do the right thing? That sounds like a tautology, right? Where somebody's just saying the same thing over and over again. But sometimes people will say, no, it's, it's doing the right thing. What people think is the right thing would actually be the wrong thing in this case because it would, it would bring about bad consequences or it would be inapplicable in this case or it would actually encourage um, some, some bad examples, or you can pick whatever sort of thing you want. If you're saying something like that, what you're saying is this looks like the right thing, but it's not really the right thing because there's a more right thing which trumps it, which is the purpose towards which we have to tend. So there's, that's teleological. And in that case, you're not actually suspending the ethical. You're actually just expanding it from within. Um, so he says, the ethical um, has nothing outside of itself that is its telos. Itself is the telos for everything outside itself. And when the ethical is absorbed this into itself, it goes not further. You can unfold and unpack and develop the, the sphere of the ethical from within it, but there's nothing outside of it that has to do with purposes or reasons or goods. Because if it has to do with purposes or reasons or goods, well, Bring it into the ethical, right? Isn't that what ethics is about? 
So that's what Kierkegaard is taking as a starting point. What about individuals in this case? He says, as soon as the individual asserts himself in his singularity before the universal, he sins. And only by acknowledging this can he again be reconciled with the universal. Um, every time he, the single individual, after having entered the universal, feels an impulse to assert himself as a single individual, he's in a spiritual trial. He's undergoing this play between the individual and the universal, or between the aesthetic, Kierkegaard speaks in several you know, places of these different stages. An aesthetic stage where one is concerned with one's own desires, one's own passions, one's own goods, and that of the whole, that of society, that of humanity in general, that of rational creatures together. Pick whatever way that you want to understand it. Even just the family is in a certain way universal as opposed to the individual. So if you have this conception of the ethical as being the realm of value, then the individual, anytime that he or she sets himself apart from it, and in opposition to it, he's doing the wrong thing. He or she is doing the wrong thing. He's sinning. He's engaging in evil. He is fallen. Insofar as that, that person, that individual is tempted to do that, that person is in what, what Kierkegaard calls a spiritual trial, where there's sort of an interplay between the two of these. And it's a question of which way are you going to go? Are you going to do what you know to be right, or are you going to do what feels good to you, or what would keep you from feeling bad, for example? And here you can see a classic clash that occurs over and over and over again uh, between different motives. I mean, we do know that we have desire that are not fitting into this realm of the universal, the ethical. Um, we have sadistic desires, some of us, to hurt other people. Um, children, you know, quite most of them at least, experience that sort of thing. We feel desires to compete with each other for attention, for dominance, for all sorts of things, whether we deserve it or not. Um, we feel envious towards other people. There are many different things that you can think of. We want to have things for ourselves, even if it means taking them away from other people. These places in opposition to what he's calling the ethical or the universal. So he says, um, how can you get out of a spiritual trial? You can work yourself out of it by repentantly surrendering as a single individual in the universal. Repentantly. That's a very important term there. It's not enough just to, to do it. One has to actually change one's mindset. Um, and he says, if this is the highest that can be said of man and his existence, then the ethical is of the same nature as a person's eternal salvation, which is his telos, forevermore and at all times. The highest that, that we could conceive of, the best, the, what, what, is, what is it, and I'll put this in classical ethical terms, what is happiness for human beings? What is the ultimate good for human beings? Does it lie then within the realm of, of the ethical? Um, it says it would be a contradiction for this to be capable of being surrendered. That is teleologically suspended. Because as soon as this is suspended, it's relinquished. Whereas that which is suspended is not relinquished, but preserved in the higher, which is its telos. So if the, the, if the purpose of human life, if the purpose of a human being ultimately lies within this realm, the realm of the, the ethical, which can be understood universally, which applies to everybody, which encompasses everything, which is intelligible, which can be made clear to everybody, which you might say could be put into a textbook, perhaps not live that way, what, what could be put into a textbook. Then there's nothing higher than this. And nothing could suspend this. But is it possible? Could there be something that's higher? Um, he says, what about faith? What about Abraham? If you think about the nature of what Abraham is doing, you know, if if you look at it in purely 
ethical terms, the way that uh, we're being invited to it, like he says, the name for what, what Abraham is doing is murder. He's trying to kill his son. God, God tells him to, sure, but God's telling him to do something that is murder. So that makes not only Abraham culpable, that makes God culpable as well. If we judge it on the, on the basis of the ethical, in part because God's not telling him to do this for any reason. He's not saying, uh, kill your son because that's going to produce the greatest benefit for the greatest amount of people, his sacrifice. He's not doing it because he's saying, this is a way in which uh, reason will work itself out in history and, and produce a, a paradise on earth or any, anything like that. This will actually cement the, the bond in our group. God's not saying anything like that. He doesn't give Abraham a reason to do it. He just tells him to do it. And so here we get to faith. Kierkegaard says, faith is this paradox that the single individual is higher than the universal. So, we go from the individual to the universal, and then beyond it, once again, to the individual. This is the stage of the religious, or faith. This is something which provides a higher telos, a higher purpose, a higher good, a higher reason which then supersedes the ethical, at least in that case. Uh, he says, the faith is this paradox, the single individual is higher than the universal. Yeah, please note, in such a way that the movement repeats itself. So that after, after having been in the universal, he as the single individual isolates himself as higher than the individual, than the universal. If this is not faith, he says, then Abraham is lost, and faith has never existed in the because it's always existed. For if the ethical, social morality is the highest, and there is in a person no residual incommensurability. Incommensurability meaning can't be boiled down, can't be translated, can't be fit back into the ethical. There's a line here that can't be crossed. The aesthetic, the individual, can in fact be assimilated into the ethical. But here we reach a point where there's, there's an overflow, a surplus that cannot be assimilated back into to the, the ethical the system, the social morality. For if in the ethical, the highest is the highest, and if there is in a person no residual incommensurability in some way that this incommensurability is not evil, another way that things can be incommensurable is through, through evil. The, the, the system, the you know, ethics, doesn't actually admit that. It, it roots it out. Now, that doesn't mean that evil doesn't continue to exist in the world, does it? That people don't do bad things. That even when they don't do bad things, sometimes they're tempted to do bad things. There's an incommensurability there, but this is an in incommensurability that lets you look at that and say, now that's wrong. That's evil. You know, there are people who do murder, and they're condemned by the the ethical, unless there's some sort of purposiveness behind it. Um, now he says something else very interesting. If that's the case, if we don't have something like this, then all we need is Greek philosophy. The categories that Greek philosophy had are sufficient to incorporate individuals, or at least allow us to figure out what in the heck is going on with people who do the right thing and, and you know, rise from being at the level of the individual to the level of the ethical, the people who remain at that level. It allows us to make sense of that. Greek philosophy would be enough. But Greek philosophy is not enough. It says, this is a very interesting place, people who are profoundly lacking in learning and are given to cliches are frequently heard to say a light shines over the Christian world, whereas a darkness entrounds paganism. This has always struck me as strange. Every more thorough thinker, every more earnest artist still regenerates himself in the eternal youth of the Greeks. The Greeks have a ton to offer us, don't they? It's quite right to say that paganism didn't have faith. But if something is supposed to have been said thereby, one must have a clearer understanding of what faith is. So what is faith? 
says, faith is precisely the paradox that the single individual, as the single individual, is higher than the universal, is justified before it. Not as an inferior to it, as when it's, you know, here, but as superior. Yet in such a way that as the single individual who, after being subordinate to, uh, as a single individual to the universal, now by means of the universal becomes a single individual who is superior. So you have to actually pass through the ethical on the way. You can't just jump from here to here. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more uh, later. So he says, it's certainly true the single individual can easily confuse this paradox with spiritual trial, the sort of thing that's happening down here, the play that's happening here. But it ought not be concealed for that reason. And it, it's certainly true that many people may be so constituted that they're repulsed by it. I know many people who we talk about this sort of thing with them, they, they, it, it drives them nuts. They want to say, no, no, faith is just purely subjective. It's down here, it's individual, it's private. Um, it has to be taken up into the, the, the universal. Um, but faith ought not, therefore, be made into something else to enable one to have it. But one ought to admit to not having it. Well, those who have faith, he says, ought to be prepared to set forth some characteristics whereby the paradox that's taking place up here is different than the spiritual trial. So this is a good place to stop and, and, and think as you're reading through this text. He's going to use these terms over and over again. Paradox, spiritual trial, paradox, spiritual trial. Spiritual trial is what is occurring when the individual is struggling as individual with the realm of the ethical, The paradox is what is occurring when the individual has actually sort of superseded the other. I'm going to erase a little bit here so that this stands out a little bit better. Let's let me put it in these terms. So at this level we have the paradox. At this level we have spiritual trust. How are these fundamentally different? Well, again, let's go back to the story of Abraham. Um, Abraham is told by God, you're to sacrifice Isaac, you're to do it in this way. And Abraham loves God, so Abraham actually goes and, and prepares to do it. So the story of Abraham contains just such a teleological suspension of the ethical. All sorts of people try to interpret it, make it into you know, allegories for this and that, and draw analogies. Um, but Kierkegaard says, if one looks more closely, I doubt very much that anyone in the whole wide world will find one single analogy, except for a later one, which proves nothing if it is certain that Abraham represents faith. Um, in ethical terms, Abraham's relation to Isaac is quite simply this. What, what does ethics teach us about fathers and sons? The father shall love the son more than himself. Within its own confines, the ethical has various gradations. It's not to say that the ethical is just one single thing. There is different levels that are possible that you can, you can proceed through. But you're always lining up within the ethical by doing so. So if you say, well, what if, the, you, know, what if you have a conflict between a son and a mother? One of them has to be sacrificed to save the life of the other. That's still within the realm of the ethical. There's a higher reason why one is doing that. One's not just sacrificing a person just for the hell of it, just for fun. Um, what, he says, when an enterprise of concern to a whole nation is impeded, when such a project is halted by divine displeasure, um, when the soothsayer carries out a sad task and announces that the deity demands a young girl to sacrifice, then the father must heroically bring the sacrifice. Fathers are supposed to love their daughters more. But, for the good of the whole, good of the, the society, sometimes people have to be sacrificed. And we actually do have uh, several cases where this takes place. If you think about not just you know, grief tragedy with Agamemnon and Iphigenia, there's also the story of Jephthah, whose own daughter, he made a vow to God. To uh, sacrifice the first who came out of his house if God would grant Israel victory. And 
God does, and the first person to come out of his house, first thing to come out of his house, is his daughter. Um, he also talks about Brutus, who, who ends up um, having his own sons executed because they opposed the state of Rome. So he says, when in the crucial moment Agamemnon, Jephthah, and Brutus heroically have overcome the agony, heroically have lost the beloved, and have only to complete the task externally, there will never be a noble soul in the world without tears of compassion for their agony. We can relate to them. We can understand them. The admiration for their deed. But if in the crucial moment these three men were to append to the heroic courage with which they bore the agony, the little phrase, but it won't happen anyway, then we we'd wonder, what's going on? He says, who would understand them? If they went on to explain, this we believe by virtue of the absurd, who would understand them any better? So what's the difference between the tragic hero and Abraham? The tragic hero remains at the level of the ethical. The tragic hero is understandable. He allows the expression of the ethical to have its telos in a higher expression of the ethical. So he sacrifices something, which is a good, for a greater good. All of that lies within the realm of the ethical. Abraham's not doing that. Abraham's doing something quite different. Says Abraham's situation is different by his act. He transgressed the ethical altogether and had a higher telos outside of it in relation to which he suspended it. What was that higher telos? Abraham loved and trusted in God and believed by virtue of the absurd that God was not going to screw him around. That even though God was commanding him to do something that went against the ethical and there wasn't any sort of, well, this is all for the better, you know, or this is for society or something like that. There was just, you're going to do this. He was still able to believe that God would bring good out of it. So he says, here the category, the necessity of a new category for the understanding of Abraham becomes apparent. Paganism does not know such a relationship to the divine. The tragic hero does not enter into any private relationship with the divine. But the ethical is the divine. So, this is the divine as father, and this is divine as private, as relationship between God and the individual human being, not just God mediated through the society, or through a priesthood, or through a kingship, or through, you know, any sort of enlightenment idea like the, the kingdom of ends or humanity as such, any sort of universal thing. It's God in relationship with concrete human beings. Uh, it says, Abraham cannot be mediated. In other words, he cannot speak. As soon as I speak, I express the universal. And if I do not do so, no one can understand me. As soon as Abraham wants to express himself, he's stuck with this. He's stuck with making sense out of things in terms of, you know, what's, what's better for everybody else, what's better for um, society, what, you know, conscient ethics would say, utilitarian ethics. Of course, Abraham doesn't know these, but he, he could make arguments along those, those sort of lines. Um, so he says, therefore, although Abraham arouses my admiration, he also appalls me. The person who denies himself and sacrifices himself because of duty gives up the finite in order to grasp the infinite and is adequately assured. We talked about this before with the, the, the uh, idea of the knight of faith um, and the hero, the, the knight of infinite resignation. Infinite resignation means being okay with things, passing up one's own desires, passing up perhaps even one's own loves, one's own good, for the sake of some other good. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the whole of society. It could be something as simple as um, giving somebody else your spot on the lifeboat.
sacrificing your own time, life, labor, energy to better the, the condition of your, your children out of love for them, that would be an expression of the, the ethical for, for uh, Kierkegaard, and that would involve infinite resignation. Abraham doesn't do that. Abraham goes beyond that. And he says, how does the single individual reassure himself that he is legitimate? It is a simple matter to level all existence to the idea of the state or the idea of society. If, if you do that, it's really easy to mediate. And you never come to the paradox that the single individual matters more. Uh, but that is exactly what Abraham is doing. So that gets us through the first of these problemata. Now let's look at the second. So the second problem that's posed in fear and trembling, is there an absolute duty to God? In the end, he's going to say the only absolute is God and our, our connection to God. But um, the absolute is understood by the ancient Greeks and also by contemporary philosophy of, of Kierkegaard's time, and also by um, you know the Enlightenment and many other philosophical movements that we could point to, would see the absolute as lying in the realm of the universal or the ethical. And that's the highest that it can reach. And it sort of brings religion into that. You know, What's good in religion, we sort of suck the, the marrow out of that, put that into the, the ethical. Um, Kierkegaard is asserting that there's something above that. So he says, the ethical is a universal, and as such, it's the divine. So it's proper to say that every duty is essentially duty to God. But if no more can be said than this, then it's also said that I actually have no duty towards God. So this is one conception that, that people have. The duty becomes duty by being traced back to God. So God is you know, the origin of why I want to do this sort of thing. But in the duty itself, I do not enter into a relation with God. It's very different to have a metaphysical principle trying to sort of live in accordance with, and to live in accordance with the, the call, the command, the cajoling, the wishes of a person, of something else, right? So he says, for instance, it's a duty to love one's neighbor. It's a duty by being traced back to God. But in the duty, I enter into a relation not to God, but to the neighbor. And you can secularize this sort of thing very easily, right? You can come up, come up with a conception of God where God is nature or God is, you know, humanity at large or God is, you know, being nice to each other or pick whatever you like, right? You can use any of those as a ground to, to love other people, to be nice to other people. He says, if in this connection that I, I then say it's my duty to love God, I'm, I'm actually just pronouncing a tautology as much as God in a totally abstract sense is here understood as the divine. Sort of like you have a duty to, to have duties. You ought to love loving. Um, well, what if you have a more robust conception of God? If you don't look at God in that way, you know, he says, insofar as one might wish to love God in another way, this love would be as implausible as the love Rousseau mentions, whereby a person loves the kaffirs instead of loving his, his neighbor. It all becomes very abstract. What if you actually love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, Kierkegaard is trying to ask us here. Um, he says, in the ethical view of life, it's the task of the single individual, down here, to strip himself of the qualification of interiority. To make things external, to make them out here for other people to see. If you love somebody, you have to express that love, otherwise the love itself doesn't exist. If you're justified, you have to show that justification. Otherwise, it doesn't really exist. He says, every time the individual shrinks from it, every time he withholds himself or slips, slips down into the qualifications of feeling, mood, etc., that belong to interiority, he trespasses, he is immersed in a spiritual trial. The paradox of faith is that there's an interiority on this higher level that is incommensurable with exterior an inter interiority that is not identical with the first, but a new interiority. So 
At the level of the ethical, everything can be made clear, everything can be exteriorized, can be made external. There's something to a person that cannot be fully expressed, that's not just the purely subjective of uh, the, the isolated individual down here, opposed to the ethical. <clears throat> it's rather that they're connected with God. And that relation itself cannot be fully cognized, it cannot be fully explained, according to Kierkegaard. So he says the paradox of faith is that this, that the single individual is higher than the universal, that the single individual determines his relation to the universal, to the ethical, by his relation to the absolute, not his relation to the absolute by his relation to the universal. The paradox may be expressed in this way, that there is an absolute duty to God, for in this relationship of duty, the individual relates himself as a single individual absolutely to the absolute. So, what is the duty here? Duty of love to God. The duty is to God, but the duty is also to, to love God, to align oneself with, with the divine. So he says, now here's, here's a very important point that often gets glossed over when Kierkegaard is being presented. So he says, from this it does not follow that the ethical should be invalidated. A lot of people want to read Kierkegaard, especially when they're doing philosophy and religion classes, as if he's saying, well, you know, you've got, you've got the individual, and then you've got the ethical, this whole realm, you know, uh, where everything can be understood and it makes sense, and, you know, philosophy fits in there. And then you have this leap into the divine, and God could tell you to do anything whatsoever. And that totally destroys this. If we accept this, then that means that anything goes. All bets are off. If God wants us all to become murderers tomorrow uh, and tells us to do that, you know, we should all try to be like Abraham. He doesn't want to stop our hands. That'd be A-OK. -okay. That is not at all what Kierkegaard is saying here. He is saying... The ethical should not be invalidated. Rather, the ethical receives a completely different expression, a paradoxical expression, such as, for example, that love to God may bring the knight of faith to give love to his neighbor. Think about how many people, and this is you know, sort of a reflection on our, our fallenness and brokenness and, and our ontological condition. Um, think about how many people who live a life in which they say they have some sort of faith relationship, um, treat other people well, even when they don't feel like it, um, and they're not, they say that they're not able to do it just by sort of, you know, looking at it as you know, being for the best or something like that. They're not able to do it, in, in essence, what a person who's in spiritual trial at this level does if they succeed in coming to the level of the ethical. Instead, they say, God helped me through it. God actually gave me the strength to, to love these other people and to not hate them like I tend to do. Um, if that's real, if that's the case, that would be what Kierkegaard is talking about here. The ethical itself becomes sort of penetrated, transvaluated by the, um, the paradoxical, by the he says, if this is not the case, then faith has no place in existence. Then faith is just a spiritual trial. There's people who think that they're in faith are really just down here, and they've got their own little quirky feelings and desires, and they're projecting this, this notion of God onto something. But, if God really exists, then it's more like this. Now notice, too, it's possible that a person could actually talk the talk of faith, and even to a certain extent walk the walk, but still be down here and be in a spiritual trial because it really, it's really about themselves and an idea that they have an absurd projection of their own desires or wishes, and not a sort of openness, a receptiveness, a willingness to, to, uh, to trust, to go, and to, to commit. So he says the paradox um, is this. The, as soon as the single individual wants to express his absolute duty in the, in 
becomes conscious of it in the universal, he recognizes he's involved in a spiritual trial. And then if he really does resist it, he will not fulfill the so-called duty. And if he does not resist it, then he, then he sins. That's what a spiritual trial is. What's going on with faith? Faith involves something coming from without, something surplus, something greater, something that leaves it not just being the individual by himself. Kierkegaard also says something else very interesting, sort of a side here. Um, can the paradox of faith actually be sort of shared or communicated? Could you maybe, you know, not necessarily turn it into a textbook, which you know, would be at the level of the universal, but could it be passed on through a spiritual discipline? Here's one place where I, myself, I would actually differ from Kierkegaard. But let's see what he actually says. He says, people fancy that the single individual can make himself understandable to another single individual in the same situation. Partnership in these areas, though, he says, is utterly unthinkable. Only the single individual can ever give himself a more explicit explanation of what is to be understood by Isaac. Um, what it is that they are supposed to sacrifice. What it is that they are supposed to um, what he sees there is the danger of people sort of trying to pull, hang on to each other's coattails and thereby ride themselves into the, uh, the, the uh, paradox and the passion of, of faith. He talks about people hoping to smuggle Christianity into the, the world um, by, by analogy. Instead, what's required is actually um, two, two things, courage and love. And he talks about himself as actually lacking the courage to do this, but as, as understanding it and recognizing that courage in others. And he says, um, the words are terrible, meaning this explanation of faith. But I dare say they can be understood without the necessary consequence that one who has understood them has the courage to do what he has understood. One ought to be sufficiently honest to admit what it says, to admit that it is great even though one himself lacks the courage to do it. Honest as he must be, honest he must be, and he must not speak of this lack of courage as humility, since on the contrary, it's actually pride. To not trust, to remain at this level, is in a way, was what Kierkegaard is saying, to remain in a kind of human pride as opposed to true humility, which lies at this level. He says, the courage of faith is the one and only true humble courage. And then he talks about love. He says, it's easy to see that if this passage is to have any meaning, it must be understood literally, the Abraham passage, and also the passage about Luke saying, the passage from Luke, where he's saying, if you want to, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. God, as he says, is the one who demands absolute love. So the absolute duty is to, to love God, but not just halfway, not just lukewarmly. To love God is to, you know, if you actually understand God as being God, God is infinitely lovable. So the absolute duty to love God is not, you know, something to fulfill halfway or a quarter of the way or even three quarters of the way. It's to fulfill absolutely. He says, anyone who in demanding a person's love believes his love is demonstrated by his becoming indifferent to what he otherwise cherishes is not merely an egotist, but is also stupid. And what he's combating here is a wrong-headed conception of what it means to love God absolutely. Does loving God absolutely mean saying everything else is garbage? Nothing compares. Everything else is just dust, detritus, vermin, pick whatever you want. It's not saying that. Like he says, um, just if we think about human beings, a man requires his wife to leave their father and mother, but if he, can, if he considers it a demonstration of her extraordinary love for him that she for his sake became an indifferent and lax daughter, He's far more stupid than the stupid. If he had any idea of what love is, he would wish to discover that she was perfect in her love as a daughter and sister. 
and he would see therein that she would love him more than anyone in the kingdom. So again, to, to put this in, into perspective, Abraham loves Isaac. It's his son. It's what he's been waiting for all this time. It's the product of him and Sarah and also God. He loves him. It's no sacrifice to give up something that you don't love. <clears throat> and if, if being told you have to do this because you love me, if to get around that you find a way to make yourself no longer love the things that you have to sacrifice, that's not doing what Kierkegaard is talking about here, nor what God demands. And like he says, we all have our Isaacs that we're asked to give up. We're not supposed to stop loving the Isaac when we do that. Um, he says, the absolute duty can lead one to do what ethics would forbid, but it can never lead the night of faith to stop loving. Um, so now let's, let's move on a little bit more. He's still talking about the distress and anxiety, the fear and trembling and the paradox of faith. And again, it comes back to this, this, this uh, contrast between the tragic hero at the level of the ethical and the night of faith. The tragic hero relinquishes himself in order to express the universal. The knight of faith relinquishes the universal. So Abraham actually says, yeah, this is murder. I'm not supposed to murder. I'm not supposed to lay, I'm not even supposed to intend harm to my son. And yet, God who I love has asked this of me. And I do love my son. I'm fulfilling my duty. Yet, God has asked this of me, and I'm going to love God more and trust in him more. Um, that's what the, 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 the uh, night of faith is giving up. He's not just giving up some individual desire that he allows himself to, to forego, some love uh, on his part that he resigns himself to losing. He's not sacrificing one thing to the good of something in society. He is actually sacrificing this entire realm of the ethical. He's allowing himself to become on the outs with the ethical that he knows does embody goodness for the sake of a higher goodness that he also understands in its proper place. So he says, as said previously, everything depends on one, one's position. Anyone who believes it's fairly easy to be the single individual can always be sure he's not the knight of faith. For fly-by-nights and injured geniuses are not men of faith. On the contrary, this knight knows it is glorious to belong to the universal. Agamemnon is a great man. Jephthah is a great man. We could go down the list. Socrates is great. He knows it is beautiful and beneficial to be the single individual who translates himself into the universal. The one who, so to speak, personally produces a trim, clean, and as far as possible, faultless edition of himself, readable to all. Socrates is probably the one who comes the closest to this, isn't he? In, you know, think about the Credo and the Phaedo and, and all of these other places where he's expressing why he's willing to die for the sake of being a gadfly to Athens, for, for the sake of, of truth. Um, he says that he knows that, that uh, it is refreshing to become understandable to himself and the universal in such a way that he understands it. And every individual who understands him in turn understands the universal in him, both rejoice in the security of the universal. That's not available to the night of faith. That capacity to sort of rest in intelligibility and universality and knowledge that this is in fact the, the right thing. Um, again, he talks about courage. He says the night of faith knows that it is inspired to give himself up for the universal that it takes courage to do it, but that there is also security in it precisely because it is a giving up for the universal. He knows it is glorious to be understood by everyone of noble mind. And yet at the same time, there is something higher calling him. Um, so, he says, whether the single individual is, is actually is undergoing a spiritual trial, or as a knight of faith, only the single individual himself can decide. And again, this is where we might differ from Kierkegaard a little bit. He's saying, 
no sort of guidebook for this is possible, no discernment of souls, as, as it was called in you know, earlier Christian traditions, is, is possible to do. But I mean, we do have to at least grant him this. These, once we get to this level, we start to talk about things that by their very nature are extremely difficult to pin down and to talk about, not just because they're dealing with you know, mysteries and, and the infinite and you know, the absolute, but because they actually take place through ordinary things which are invested with much greater meaning. Um, so one has to, you know, um, look to see if, if, here's where the criteria comes in. Has the night of faith actually passed through the ethical onto the religious? Or are they trying to make a jump from here to here? In that case, they're just in a spiritual trial, and all that's going on is a sort of oscillation between the ethical and the aesthetic, and then if Abraham is doing that, Abraham is really um, evil and demon, demoniac, Kierkegaard would say. But he doesn't think that that's the case for Abraham. He thinks that in Abraham's case, it's this. So that is problem two. Is there an absolute duty to God? Yes, there is. And this is what it looks like. And this is how it takes shape. It doesn't invalidate or nullify the realm of the ethical. As a matter of fact, it loves it even so. Uh, it, it actually acknowledges it and says, yes, this is all good, but there is something yet higher that we have to respect. And that permeates the realm of the ethical. So you might say, it's not, for somebody like Kierkegaard, it's not possible to fully grasp this realm of perfect intelligibility all the way through, to grasp its own goodness without the light which is irritated upon it and through it and permeates it from the level of the religious. Now we have to look at problem three. So we're coming to a close now with, with problem three. Was it ethical, was it ethically defensible for Abraham to conceal his understanding? Uh, and who did he conceal it from? From Sarah, from Eliezer, and from Isaac. So a very interesting way of asking this. You know, it's not just did Abraham conceal his understanding from Joe Blow on the street or anybody else? Was it ethically defensible for him to conceal his understanding of what was going on from those to whom he was most close, with whom he had lived for almost his entire life, or at least their lives, and who he loved? Good question. And before we actually jump into that, I want to read you two, two passages, and I want to make a sort of remark about this, this section. One of the passages is very short, so I'm going to read you that first. He says, um, this is a note, uh, close when he's talking about Faust, he says, um, ethics is a dangerous branch of knowledge. And it was surely possible that Aristophanes, for purely ethical reasons, decided to let laughter pass judgment on the perverse age. Um, Aristophanes was well known for his form of comedy in which, which uh, laughter was actually used to pass political judgment upon people. Um, ethics is a dangerous branch of knowledge. When you actually move into the ethical, it's not just all light and air and sweetness and you know, strings playing or anything like that. Um, it forces tough choices upon you to really, to really align oneself with the ethical means turning oneself inside out quite often. And, and actually, you know, as we say, ripping out one's heart, sacrificing things that one would ordinarily want. That's what it means to truly be in the realm of the ethical. That's what tragic heroes actually do, those who fit into that. The other thing, the other passage that I want to hit on has to do with sin. And he says, here I would like to make a comment that says more than has been said at any point previously. So when Kierkegaard says that, I think that's an important one to, to look at. He says, 
Sin is not the first immediacy. So it's been talked about as if, well, you've got the individual at the level of the aesthetic, and then you've got the universal at the level of the ethical. Insofar as the individual is out of line with the ethical, follows his own desires, um, has wishes that are contrary to the ethical order, he or she sins. Um, so he says, sin is not the first immediacy, sin is a later immediacy. In sin, the single individual is already higher than the universal. So, interesting. When you're having a spiritual trial, or when you have sin, the things that are going on at this level, Sin, or what he's also going to call the demoniac. Um, the individual has made him or herself higher than the universal. This is actually a possibility. Now, they aren't actually higher than the universal in the sense that they belong there, but by ethics, by right, by any of that sort of stuff. But that is actually a possibility. So he says, um, the single individual is higher in the direction of the demonic paradox than the individual because it is a contra contradiction on the part of the universal to want to demand itself from a person who lacks the conditio sine qua non for it. it, it there's, a, there's a contradiction between the ethical demanding of people who can't give to the ethical what the ethical is demanding from them for the ethical to be demanding that. So in a certain way, the ethical is unethical, he's saying here. He's saying the, uh, the ethical is demanding more than it ought to, more than it has a right to. And so, you know, this is a very platonic sort of point, you know, uh, is the ethical itself ethical? He says, if with other things, philosophy were also able, were also to think that it might just enter a man's head to want to act according to its teaching, we would get a strange kind of comedy out of it. An ethics that ignores sin is a com completely futile discipline. But if it affirms sin, then it has eo ipso exceeded itself. Very interesting point here. What he's talking about here are the possibilities for philosophy to, you might say, get beyond it, its own limits. It might turn it into something other than philosophy in the process. But this is a possibility for philosophy. If philosophy does not take sin seriously, then it, there's something wrong with it. It's lacking something. There's a, a superficiality to it. And part of the, the, the fact of sin is that the individual can stand against the, the ethical. If philosophy does take sin seriously, then suddenly it has to start opening itself up to that which goes beyond it, the realm of the religious. So this is a very important and very interesting point, one that's, you might say, pregnant uh, rather than fully developed. Philosophy teaches that the immediate should be annulled, he says. That's true enough, but what is not true is that sin is directly the immediate any more than that faith is directly so sin and faith, in some ways, flip sides of the same coin. I'm not saying that, that, that they're identical or that sin becomes faith or anything like that. But within Kierkegaard's, uh, Kierkegaard's understanding of philosophy and faith, uh, unless you actually take account of the meaning of sin, it becomes impossible to, to fully understand this, this schema. So, those are the remarks that I wanted to begin with. What is going on in this, this problem? He's telling a lot more stories in this one than he has been in any of the other ones. And he's, he's reiterating a lot of um, points that he's made already. So I'm going to skip over them. I'm going to try to hit on what's, what's actually new in this. And he says, it would be best at this point to consider the whole question purely aesthetically, and to that end, enter an aesthetic inquiry, to which I invite the reader to give his entire attention momentarily. So now he's opening up this, this bottom level. And he talks about the category of the interesting. And he says the interesting is a border category between aesthetics and ethics. The 
Accordingly, this examination must constantly wander into the territory of ethics. Um, so, what's going on there? I'm going to skip over some of these, these, these issues. Um, what about the, the case of, of Agamemnon? He, he talks about Agamemnon about to sacrifice Iphigenia. Aesthetics demand silence of Agamemnon, inasmuch as it would be unworthy of the hero to see comfort from any other person. So at that level, uh, where he's being depicted, we sort of leave him to himself, and there is an interiority to it. But what does aesthetics do? It finds other ways to, to open this up for it, to, to us, he says. Um, in order to be a hero, the hero has to be tried in this dreadful spiritual trial. Um, what does aesthetics do? It has a way out. It has the old servant to disclose everything. Now everything is in order. But ethics has no coincidence and no old servant at its disposal. The aesthetic idea contradicts itself as soon as it's to be implemented in actuality. For this reason, ethics demands disclosure. To be ethical, to be in the realm of the ethical according to Kierkegaard, means being able to explain yourself even if that, not just the action, but the explanation, turns you inside out. Maybe even wrecks you. Um, he talks about um, the tragic hero. He says, the tragic hero demonstrates his ethical courage in that he himself, not prey to any aesthetic illusion, announces, announces Iphigenia's fate to her. If he does that, then the tragic hero is ethics beloved son in whom it is well pleased. Um, if he remains silent, it may be because he believes it would make it easier for others, but it may also be because he makes it easier for himself. His heroic deed requires courage, but part of this courage is that he does not avoid any argument. And he goes on with other examples like this. Um, and he, he also brings up the category of the, uh, the aesthetic which, which ends up being the demoniac. And one of the possibilities for us is instead of ascending to the religious to sort of say to the ethical, no, I'm not going to do it. I will stand against you. And why does he call this the demoniac? Well, you know, if you, if you think about what it was that was the original sin, not, not human original sin, but even going further back, what was it? It was, it was pride. It was saying, I will not. I will be what I am, and I will not have somebody else over me. Even the, the ethical. And that can take different shapes, and Kierkegaard is very attuned to how easily this may seem to some people like the stage of the religious. But there is, while there's desire, while there's passion, there is not actually any true love in the, the demoniac. Um, he talks about, um, well, let me read a short passage where he's starting with, with Richard III, a great example of a demoniac character, he says, um, Natures such as those are basically the paradox, and they are by no means more imperfect than other people, ex except that they are either lost in the demon, the demon the demonic paradox, often because of pain, often because they're rejected. You know, Richard III, he's invited to sort of lose himself in the realm of the ethical, but he's always going to be the, the person down if he does that. They are either lost in the demonic paradox or saved in the divine paradox. Time and time again, people have been pleased that witches, misses, trolls, or malformed creatures, and no doubt everyone has an inclination when he sees a malformed person to attach them to the idea of moral depravity. What a glaring injustice, since the relation ought to be turned around. Existence itself has damaged them, he says just as a stepmother makes the children perverse. The demonic for which the individual himself has no guilt has its beginning and is originally being set outside of the universal by nature or a historical situation. So this is not the same thing as the realm of the religious though. This is not what is going on with Abraham. Let me go on to Abraham where we're going to get to 
to come to a close fairly soon. He says, how did he act? Um, I have not forgotten, the reader will please remember, I got involved in the previous discussion to make that subject an obstacle, not as if Abraham could thereby become more comprehensible, but in order that the incomprehensibility could become more salient. For as I said before, I cannot understand Abraham, I can only admire him. Abraham did not speak. He did not speak to Sarah, or to Eleazar, or to Isaac. He bypassed these three ethical authorities. For instance, for Abraham, the ethical had no higher expression than family life. Aesthetics allowed even demanded silence of that single individual. If he knew by remaining silent, he could save another. This alone adequately shows that Abraham is not within the realm of aesthetics either. His silence is not in order to save Isaac. In fact, his whole task of sacrificing Isaac for his own and for God's sake is an offense to aesthetics. Because it is able to understand I sacrifice myself, but not that I sacrifice someone else for my own sake. Meanwhile, ethics passed judgment on him because he was silent on account of his individual accidental particularity. Um, Abraham cannot speak, he says, because he cannot say that which would explain it. That is, so it is understandable. That it is an ordeal <clears throat> such that, what is the temptation? The temptation is not to give in to the individual, the aesthetic, but to give in to the ethical. Sometimes, sometimes, not all times, sometimes, Kierkegaard is saying, God can demand of us that we go beyond what it is that human beings and philosophy and natural human reason working itself out and society have given to us reliable guides most of the time as knowledge of good and evil. Sometimes we actually have to go beyond that and trust in, in God and express love for God by making that choice, making that commitment, he would say. So um, he ends up saying, here again, it is apparent one can perhaps understand Abraham, but only in the way one understands the paradox. I, for my part, perhaps can understand Abraham, but I also realize I do not have the courage to speak in this way, no more than I have the courage to act as Abraham did. But by no means do I therefore say the act is of little importance, since on the contrary, it is the one and only marvel. That's where I'm going to leave off with our exposition of fear and trembling. You've seen us go through many different themes involved in this. This schema of the religious, the ethical, the aesthetic has now become quite, quite clear. And uh, Abraham, as we can see, is something quite different. A sort of rupture in thinking, a paradox. And not just any kind of paradox. There are other paradoxes available, Kierkegaard is perfectly willing to say. Not everything that is irrational is necessarily faith. It has to, in fact, pass through the rational and recognize the rationality and the goodness of the rational, the universal, the ethical, before it can subsume it or teleologically suspend it in the religious. <clears throat>